there has been a shocking turn of events. I actually felt quite sad about how my boobs looked in the dress that I was wearing. It's hard to feel like my body is my own. Oh, who's that over there? Mmm, maybe a little bit of reproductive sex. Oh my god. It makes me feel so alive. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Hormone Diaries. It has been a while, but I thought because I'm now a year postpartum, a whole year and having a one-year-old means being sick a lot of the time from things that they bring back from their nursery, from childminders, so hence this croaky voice. And I'm trying to lean into it sounding sexy, so if you're into that, then you're welcome. But I wanted to do a one year postpartum Q&A because it's been a while since I've done a Hormone Diaries update and things have changed over the last year, obviously so much. I made lots of videos at the beginning about like the birth and my initial postpartum, like fourth trimester experience and about breastfeeding. But it's interesting to see kind of like how I think about those things now a year on as well. So I asked for your questions over on Instagram, but before we dive into them, if you are new here, I've been making a series called The Hormone Diaries for years. It started out with me coming off the pill for the first time after being on the pill for seven years and documenting the return of my period and all of that. And then we rebooted it when I got pregnant, what fun. Actually, no, that's not true. We rebooted it when I was trying to conceive. I documented the whole experience of that. It took us a year and then the pregnancy and then the birth and postpartum and here we are. Maybe we'll still be doing this when I'm menopausal. So here we are, I have a one-year-old child, but this video is not gonna be about that. It's gonna be about me and let's answer your questions. What, if anything, prepared you best for labor? Congrats, by the way, thank you. I do think that the one year birthday should be like more of a celebration of the parents. But what prepared me for labor? To be honest, I think the thing that did me good, especially as I had a four day labor and an unplanned C-section, like on paper, that sounds like it didn't go so well and that I would have had a bad experience, but I didn't. I think the thing that helped was having no expectations. Yes, of course, I had some dreams, some wishes, but ultimately I was really going in, like, who knows what's gonna happen? Let's just go with the flow, it's gonna be fine. And then controversially, one of the things that I did or didn't do was watch birth videos. And I know that this is something that a lot of pregnant people do to kind of prepare themselves for birth, know what to expect, but that was just not my vibe. I think because I have an ileostomy and because I've had previous abdominal surgery and that put me in quite a unique position, I just knew that it was gonna be very difficult for me to find birth videos of somebody who had exactly my medical situation and history. And so I just thought that there was no point in me even like anticipating anything else or comparing my potential birth to anyone else's. I was just like, my birth is gonna be my birth, let's go. <laughs> Has your sex drive changed since before you got pregnant? Interesting, because before I got pregnant, I think my sex drive was probably at its lowest because we'd been trying to conceive for so long and sex had become this like chore and quite an unsexy thing and something that wasn't resulting in the desired effect. And so even though I'm having less sex now than I was pre getting pregnant, I think my sex drive is probably higher now because I'm more interested in it. But I actually think my sex drive is so tied to how much and what kind of sex that I'm having. So like the more sex I have, the more I want sex. So I would probably describe my sex drive as kind of low now, but that's just because the amount of sex I'm having is low. Is that true though? It depends on the type of sex we're talking about. Maybe there'll be more questions about that. Is there anything you would do differently second time around trying to conceive pregnancy and postpartum? Ah, oh, I've been thinking about this. I think the main thing that stands out to me is something that I would consider doing differently is not as rigorously tracking my cycle. I actually really enjoyed doing it last time and I loved having that data about my body. I think it's more practically because 
I don't know when we're gonna start trying to conceive again, but if I'm still getting the kind of shit sleep that I'm getting now, then tracking my temperature in that way won't work because you're supposed to have had like a full night's sleep and wake up around the same time every day and then like take your temperature as the first thing you do before you do anything else in order to get an accurate reading. Whereas like my sleep pattern now does not lend itself in any way, shape or form for then me to get accurate data from that. So I wouldn't do that again just because of current practical reasons. But in terms of the rest of it, it's so hard to tell because every pregnancy and every baby and every postpartum experience, even with the same person, is gonna be different. So if it's a case of like just taking every day as it comes and seeing where things go, then no, I'm not gonna change that attitude to things. I think one thing that will be different, hopefully, fingers crossed, is if I do manage to get pregnant again, I now know, hopefully again, what stoma bags to upgrade to as my belly and my stoma increase in size. Hopefully, again, hopefully, because you never know, it could be completely different. I know now what size bags I need. And so there isn't gonna be that period of like pain and trial and error. Hopefully I can just be like, okay, yeah, this one's too small. Now let's go to the next one, fingers crossed. How did pregnancy and birth affect your mental health? I'm worried that it will really impact mine. My friend, don't worry about things that haven't happened yet and that are not necessarily inevitable. <laughs> I know that's easier said than done, but either pregnancy and birth are gonna affect your mental health or they're not. How much control do you have over those things? Probably very little. So why feel bad about it now when you don't have to? And as somebody who's never really had full on like mental health problems, that's easy for me to be like, don't worry, be happy, it's fine. But as far as I'm aware, general like good mental health kind of like for everyone advice is about being in the moment and living in the present and trying not to worry about things that haven't happened yet and that you have no control over. So I found that pregnancy and birth really didn't affect my mental health all that much other than the first like trimester of pregnancy when I was really ill and felt very isolated. That was really difficult to deal with, but my mental health improved once I told people that I was pregnant and people could like support me and <laughs> be with me during that difficult time. How's your stoma and abs? My abs are still separated 1.5 years post-birth. So I actually surprisingly didn't get the thing that I can't remember the name of where like your abs separate, but I don't know whether that's because my abs have literally already been separated by like an incision, <laughs> like cutting them open and then they've like come back together and there's loads of scar tissue. I do not know, but I didn't get the thing that some pregnant people get where it like separates your abs. I did quite a bit of Pilates at the beginning of my postpartum experience, like the first six months I was doing Pilates once a week and that really helped with my core strength. And my stoma has been doing pretty good since pregnancy. It's actually gone back down to the original size that it was before I got pregnant, which wasn't a guarantee, but is really great for me because I liked the stoma that I had before. And also it means I've gone back to using the same bag that I was using before, which I really liked that bag. I liked how it worked. So that's good for me as well, just in terms of like medical admin and just being like, okay, yep, I know how this works, crack on. I definitely feel weaker. <laughs> in my abs, but actually nowhere near as weak as I did like post-surgery recovery the first time around. I don't know whether that's just because I do so much walking and carrying a massive baby. Did you have any negative feelings towards your partner for him having more freedom? And if so, how did you deal with it? So yeah, definitely had this, but also it was something that we talked about before and during, and I think that's how I dealt with it. It was something that I anticipated of like, I think I'm probably gonna be jealous of your freedom, but I want to breastfeed. And really being <laughs> the breastfeeding one is what kind of limited my freedom because I have to be around the baby every three hours, especially like at the beginning, at least. And so it was about recognizing that that was my choice, that was our choice, and knowing that me being kind of resentful of him was like a consequence of that, but the pros still outweighed the cons, and me being able to be honest and just verbalize to him, like, ah, oh, like I'm a bit jealous of you being able to do this. But actually it's kind of gone both ways because my partner has also said to me that he is kind of jealous sometimes of the full days that I get with Rowan. And that's 
really interesting as well. Like it's Dan's birthday coming up soon and he said that he just wants to take the day off work for his birthday and take Rowan to the soft play that we go to because he's seen like all the photos and videos I take when we're there and he's like, I wanna go, I wanna join in the fun. It kind of goes both ways and you deal with it by talking about it rather than letting it fester. For people going through infertility, what reflections can you offer now that you're one year postpartum? I don't know if I can because you know, I can't say just keep trying, it'll happen eventually because I don't know that, that's not necessarily true. All I can really say is the thing that helped me during that time was, again, living in the present and very much enjoying my life at that time rather than wishing it was over. I was like, oh, I'm doing this fun thing with my friends that I wouldn't be able to do if I was pregnant or had a baby. And also I was doing gratitude practice throughout that whole time as well. And I think that super helped as well. So even though there was this thing kind of like looming over us of like this thing that we wanted, but we didn't have at the time, still being able to look at my life every day and just be like, what are some things I'm grateful for? What are some things that I love about today, my life right now? That really helped. And actually now that I have had a whole year of being a parent, I'm so grateful that I enjoyed those last moments of not being pregnant and not being a parent. I'm so glad that I was able to still be happy in that time and enjoy myself and that not be like a miserable lead up to like when my real life gets to start because that's not how it is. Have you discovered anything new in terms of sex postpartum? I've discovered that you can get a really tight pelvic floor after having a C-section where everything closes up. I didn't know that that was a thing. I just assumed that because my vagina was untampered with during labor and birth that there would be no problems. And yet, here we are. How long did it take you to feel fully recovered after your C-section? I don't know if I can remember well enough to put a date on it, but I remember feeling like pretty good by the time that Dan was going back to work, which was six weeks, which is like roughly about the time that they tell you. I will say that I was very determined about getting out and about and walking every day, even if it was just for like 10, 15 minutes. Recovering from surgery, that is something that I have done before. I know the best practices. <laughs> It is just moving as much as you possibly can. Not so much that you're in physical pain, but enough that you are able to like recover and get moving and get strong again. I felt fully recovered quite quickly, I think. Did you feel like a real mum immediately? Or how long did it take you to realize, I still don't feel like a real mum? Nope, I am not sure when that will sink in. So I have this thing, please let me know if you also do this. But when I'm out with Rowan, say I'm pushing him in the buggy, I have this internal monologue that everybody must be looking at me being like, oh my God, she's such a young mum. But I'm 31 years old. <laughs> there is nothing strange about somebody my age having a child. I don't know why that is my internal monologue. I just see myself as much younger and I just think like, oh my goodness, I can't have a baby. I'm like too young. <laughs> but then I look at myself and I'm like, oh wait, no, you are 31. This is, <laughs> no one is shocked, Hannah, no one is shocked. Has your milk production stayed the same over the last year or is that constantly changing? I honestly don't know. I still nurse him and he's still getting what he wants. I know that after he turned about eight months and he started doing like full days at his childminders, he started having less milk, but I've been like pumping more than he's been drinking. And then on days when he's with me, he might have more than what he has when he's not with me. So who knows? All I know is that like my production and my supply has been fine. Supply and demand. How has having a baby affected your sex life? Well, I did a whole Hormone Diaries episode about intimacy, my relationship and sex after having a baby. There have been some changes though since that video and I am still planning on making a video about my like pelvic floor stuff. But all I'll say now is that there has been a shocking turn of events in a good way. Has your menstrual cycle changed in any noticeable ways? Symptoms, PMS, flow, etc. Interesting question. This is also probably gonna come up in that next episode of the Hormone Diaries 2 where I'm talking about my pelvic floor. But in short, I have had one period since having my baby. I'm currently on day 32, 33 of this cycle. So we will see. 
I was previously quite prone to having long cycles, so who knows? Not entirely sure how it's different. The only thing that I noticed from my last period that changed was I got backache, like lower back pain, rather than just like abdominal period pains. And those back pains that I was getting were very similar to the back pains I had during labor. It was horrible. I really hope that that is not gonna become a staple of my periods going forward, please, no. I also didn't get any achy boobs in the lead up to having that period, which is something that I used to get, so we will see. Switching between mom and wife mode. I have to say mom, I'm sorry. To be honest, I don't think I find this that difficult, and I don't think it should be something that is like a switch, and it's like when mom mode is on, that means wife mode is off, or when wife mode is on, that means mom mode is off, because they all just like bleed into each other because you are like one person. I am just one full human being and I can have all of these different identities at the same time. You know, I could be looking after Rowan and cooking dinner and being flirty and sexy with my husband all at the same time. Dan and I are definitely also taking advantage of the fact that we can still like flirt with each other and like talk quite openly about sex for now. And then we're like, oh, when he gets older, we probably like shouldn't say that around him. Sexual currency, baby, it can happen at any time. How do you connect with your husband outside of caring for your child? Well, sexual currency. Oh my God, how many times have I mentioned sexual currency in a video without actually making a whole video about sexual currency? I mean, we have time to connect with each other after Rowan has gone to bed in the evenings, but sometimes that's just sitting on the sofa watching TV together or apart. Like, sometimes we're connecting, other times we're like, I just need to be by myself. But really, when we're just like going about our lives and when we're in the same room together, we make a point and an effort to acknowledge each other, to listen to each other, to, you know, say hello, <laughs> recognize that the other person is also there in the room with you. Like, it's so easy just to become passing ships and to be going about things and not really like see that that other person is there just because you're so used to them, they become part of the scenery. And it's about making a real effort for that not to happen. And so it's about connecting with each other, not in these like big moments of like, oh my God, we've got a date night, like putting all of the pressure on that one evening to connect and to rekindle all of the lost intimacy over the last few months, no. What it is, it's just all of these like small moments, all of these little moments throughout our days, weeks. And then when we do get a date night, that's also great, but it's even more fun because there's all of this like pent up, sexual and like intimate energy throughout all of that time. So then when we get real time together, we're like, oh my God, you, hi. <laughs> How long did it take to feel like your body was 100% your own again, slash does it to feel like that yet? No, it doesn't feel like that yet. I think especially because I'm still sharing the bed with Rowan, he still breastfeeds during the day and at night. So, <laughs> It's hard to feel like my body is my own. So this is gonna sound really silly, but this is one thing that has actually helped in this case a little bit, which is when I have an evening out away from Rowan, whether that's like a work thing or a social thing, I now make the point to wear a non-nursing bra. Oh my God. It makes me feel so alive. <laughs> it sounds so ridiculous, but my whole last year has been spent in nursing bras, which at first, great, so comfy, so useful. But I was at a wedding recently and I actually felt quite sad about how my boobs looked in the dress that I was wearing. And I got Dan to like do some crazy like safety pinning of the straps at the back to like lift my boobs up in a way that like actually made me feel confident and comfortable and like good. And so that experience made me realize, oh, like there is like a disconnect here between like how I want to feel and how I want to look and how these bras are looking on me. So I've been making a point of like when I don't have to wear a nursing bra, actually like wearing one of my old bras that like make me feel really good. Like even right now I'm wearing a nursing bra because I still have to pump when I'm working and it's so much easier to pump with a nursing bra. Are you worried about your hormones when breastfeeding comes to an end? I hadn't even thought about it. So I'm just going to ignore that question and continue to not worry about it and then whatever happens will happen. How have your opinions about having another child changed in the postpartum period? Oh my God, they have changed so 
much. It's actually been wild to see how much they have changed. And it's got to be a hormonal thing because I remember in those first few months, my body was viscerally like, oh my God, the idea of being pregnant again, like, oh, uh, never. And now I'm like, ooh, pregnancy. <laughs> ooh, who's that over there? Mm, maybe a little bit of reproductive sex. It is wild, like how quickly that change like happened. It was like absolutely grotesque, disgust, no, don't come anywhere near me to be like, oh, hello, weird. Did pregnancy and delivery trigger IBD related medical PTSD? Fellow IBD -er here. Okay, so no, it didn't trigger any medical related PTSD. However, delivery did trigger some IBD. <laughs> so in the first like few months postpartum, I was also dealing with having a flare up of my colitis in my rectum, which was not fun. It was not the time to be doing it, but it kind of makes sense to me because IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, is a autoimmune disease and pregnancy is a natural immunosuppressant. Your immune system is suppressed when you're pregnant. And so that would have like chilled out my symptoms and then baby comes out and suddenly my immune system is like, all right, we're back at work now. And so it just starts attacking my rectum again. So I had a really bad time with that for a few months, but then it stopped. It, it just went away. Well, actually, that's not true. I started using steroid suppositories again, um, but I'm not anymore and it's still chilled out. So no PTSD, but yes to IBD. <laughs> how to get excited to get pregnant again when you know how hard it was. Yeah, it was hard. And yet my brain is still like, that sounds like a good idea. I think you'll just get excited when it's the right time for you to get excited. I don't think you have to force yourself to get excited about it. And also you don't have to be excited about it at all. I think I'm like excited by the idea of having another baby. I'm not excited about being pregnant again, really. I'm just like, that is a thing that I will endure consensually. I will do it. Not happy about it, but I'll do it. How have you found dressing your postpartum body? This is a super interesting question because it has changed and something has happened more recently that is kind of weird and I wasn't expecting and is a bit of an odd, difficult one to talk about. Initially, in those first few months postpartum, I mean, it was all about the comfy clothes, especially with like the C-section recovery. You know, it was just big, baggy, loose, comfy clothes, very similar to what I was wearing in pregnancy. We love it. Great. And actually I've made some videos on my More Hannah channel that has been about outfits and styling postpartum and especially with breastfeeding. So outfits that basically allow for a bit of boob access. And I did an autumn winter version and a spring summer version if you are interested. But the weird thing that has happened recently is I had just suddenly lost a lot of weight. Wasn't expecting this. I don't know how. I don't know why it's now just happened a year on. So much of the postpartum body narrative is either really toxic and really fat phobic, bouncing back, losing the baby weight and just like ugh, gag, gag, gross, absolutely stay away from me. And then the other side of it is the kind of like more body positive, body acceptance, body neutrality, like trying to push back from that. So I was fully going into postpartum of like, I'm not gonna put any pressure on myself to like lose this baby weight. I'm just gonna let my body do whatever it's going to do. I am gonna focus though on, you know, like recovering from my C-section and like being strong enough to like look after and lift my baby. And so what my body did is just what it did naturally. And I did lose the baby weight gradually but then now like something else has happened and now I don't fit into any of my clothes and I feel kind of apprehensive about mentioning this online just because we do live in a fat phobic society that thinks that thin is like the ideal and so there will be people who will be like don't complain about losing weight but the whole problem is that we see talking about losing or gaining weight as something that is either positive or negative. I view my losing weight as just neutral like it's it is what it is whatever the annoying thing is that I don't fit into many of my clothes. <laughs> I know weight and especially like postpartum weight can be a really sensitive subject for some people. So I'm not gonna like go into any more detail about it. But all I'll say is that it's not something that I was expecting. And I've spoken to one friend about it. Cause I was like, this is really weird. Like why has this happened? And she was like, it happened to me too around that exact time. So I just wanted to put it out there as a weird thing. 
I'm assuming it's because I'm still breastfeeding and breastfeeding burns a lot of calories. But back to your question in terms of dressing my postpartum body, swings and roundabouts, it's been tricky. <laughs> How's your relationship with nudity one year postpartum? Interesting question. I don't think it's really changed that much. The only thing that feels different is I don't feel as like intimate and aware of my C-section scar as I am with my abdominal surgery scar. And I wish I was more so, but it's basically because I can't bloody see it. <laughs> and I kind of wish I could see it. But with like belly and pubes in the way, it's not really something that I get to know. And I don't know, I think I would like to maybe spend a bit more time in front of a mirror and stuff with it. But time, you know, time. How have you found adapting to the lack of sleep slash interrupted sleep? You just find it. You just do it. <laughs> How ready do you feel to try again, both body-wise and starting the fertility journey again? I think I'm probably in a better position going into the fertility journey again, just because I wasn't expecting it to take as long as it did the first time around, whereas now I'm like going in with like the expectations of it's gonna take as long as it's gonna take. So I think I'm hopefully in a better mental place with that. Body-wise, I don't feel ready just because I was at like my peak level of fitness before I got pregnant with Rowan because I was doing so much cycling and I was doing so much tennis. So I was like physically quite strong. And I think that really helped me throughout pregnancy and then also postpartum, especially with having a C-section. And so I ideally would want to set myself up for that same kind of experience, but obviously like you can't predict these things. And whilst yes, as I said, I'm thin, which to me is a neutral statement. Thin does not mean good. I'm not strong. If I'm walking uphill for a long period of time, I am like out of breath, my stamina is dog shite. So I think I would wanna like work on some of those things just to get like my strength up before getting pregnant again, because that will just be so much harder. What's been the most unexpected emotion you felt? Boredom. I wasn't expecting to feel so bored, especially at the beginning. How has your relationship with your boobs changed since breastfeeding? Do they feel less sexual? They never were like super sexual for me personally to begin with, but they were sexual for my partner. And now, yes, I guess they are less sexual because they are mostly used for breastfeeding. But there is also this like fun element of teasing with my partner because they're like out of limits for him. And so that's like a fun thing to play with. And then occasionally when they are available for him, then it becomes like, again, another fun thing to play with. So yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like, I don't really have a strong feeling about my boobs. It's just more about the like practicalities of access. <laughs> Ooh, tips for breastfeeding with an ostomy. I don't think I've asked this question before. This is a great question because now that I think about it, I do have some tips. I have an ileostomy. You might have a different kind, but if it's somewhere on your abdomen, this might apply. If possible, especially in those like early nights, if possible, if your baby can like wait a couple of minutes and you're gonna be doing some sitting up breastfeeding where they're like lying across your stomach, empty your bag first. Especially in those early days when like Rowan could be breastfeeding like on the boob for like 40 minutes just latched and sucking and if my bag was full if it was quite gassy and he was just on top of it and it was kind of uncomfortable and also he's quite heavy or the way that he was leaning on it I was like scared that you know it was gonna like peel off or like put pressure on it in a certain way so for peace of mind I always liked to like have an empty bag before feeding especially at night so much more difficult though because like you get woken up to a crying baby who needs to feed and then you're like grabbing them to put them on you to feed and you're like ah oh, fuck my bag is full that is kind of stressful and those would be situations where I'd be like Dan take Rowan keep him soothed whilst I empty my bag and then I can like sit and commit to like feeding for a while the other thing was is because I usually would sleep naked having Rowan like directly on my naked belly and on my bag again caused a lot of anxiety and uncomfortableness of like rummaging and like putting pressure on it and pulling and tugging on it in certain ways. So it would be about either like wearing something to cover it or like having me duvet Rowan so that there was like a barrier there in between us to stop so much movement. I hope that makes sense and I hope that that helps. All things they never told you about pregnancy slash labor slash birth slash postpartum. There's one main thing that comes to mind that I was not prepared for and that was the sweats, the postpartum sweats. All of that water in your body that just needs to come out. I was sleeping on a towel, I was drenched, it was horrendous. But it only lasted a few weeks, just a few weeks. 
What type of birth control would you most likely use going forward? I actually went on the pill like three weeks after Rowan was born because I couldn't be fucked having periods. So I went on the progesterone only pill and then my period came back, even though I was on that pill. And so I stopped taking the pill. And now condoms are my method of choice. What does your vulva and pelvic floor feel like one year after birth? Mine is so different. I mean, they've been on a journey. I made a whole video about what the fuck was up with my vulva because I had like quite a lot of sores and stuff on my vulva after birth. And then my pelvic floor is just tight, 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 tight. But my vulva feels pretty normal now and my pelvic floor is getting there. Do you feel like people should have therapy before becoming a parent? I'm scared to fuck up my kids. I've not read it, but there is this book by Philippa Perry that is called something like the book you wish your parents had read. And I believe she's a therapist. So I think if you are having these worries, that book has come highly recommended and I would recommend having a look and giving that a read and hopefully it helps. <laughs> and that is it. Thank you so much for your questions. I hope that you found this interesting, maybe even useful. <laughs> it has been a wild ride from trying to conceive to pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and now like a whole year on. If you are at any point of this journey, I wish you all of the best and sending you lots of love and support and solidarity. And I'm sure you'll also find a lot of that in the comments if you so wish to share some of your own experiences or if you have any follow-up questions, I'll be in the comments too. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much to my patrons. If you wanna join our special little club, the common room, these are the people that help make these videos possible. You also get lots of fun little perks like access to our community discord server, early access to videos, monthly reading lists from me and also monthly live streams amongst a bunch of other things. There's also some episodes of the Handan podcast in there of me and my husband Dan talking about his experience of the birth and us chatting about you know, being parents and stuff like that. So you can go and check that out if you so wish. And I hope that you're doing well and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.